I've, I've only been in a Unitarian church once before in my life, and that's when I was a young man in Sheffield. I went to evening classes. I'd started reading philosophy and didn't get on very well with it. And I noticed that the local Unitarian church had evening classes in philosophy. And I went along and the minister on one occasion asked us to write down a summum bonum. Now, for those of you that don't know, as he explained, this is Latin for your supreme good. What was our understanding of the supreme good? Well, I suppose I was about 20 two or three at that time, and having spent a little bit of time trying to read books, trying to get the answers to some of the big questions that were worrying me, I was already begun to figure out that there were, were occasions in life when somehow one seemed to see a moment of clarity, something seemed to come into focus, probably just noticed something. I was a young farmer then and uh, you, know, you just suddenly stroke an animal and you just are aware of it. Or you look and see the grass and notice something that is it where it wakes you up. Well of course I didn't have the language then but I, I felt these were valuable moments and I had actually started jotting them down and uh, just all on bits of paper, so I've, I've, I sort of felt they were valuable. Anyway, that's what I wrote on, on this, for this request of the Summum Bonum. And he didn't comment on it, and I'm rather sorry I didn't keep what I wrote then. <clears throat> but then later on, <clears throat> when I, I joined a school of meditation when I was 26, and uh, we were told, to, we, were the, we came to groups and we were asked to sometimes just to participate in a group. And we were told to speak from our own experience. And I was surprised really to realise how most people start off, I think, you know, or they quote something from somebody else. Not many people actually speak from their own experience, their own unique experience. But I was taught to do this and it stood me in good stead. To trust my own experience. And if any of you are interested to read my books, you'll see that they're almost 100% written from experience. I think there's hardly a word in them that starts with I think or in my opinion or in my understanding. They're all direct experience. And so if I may I'd like to start this afternoon's proceedings with inviting you just to be present with me here. Just feel your bottom on the chair or the floor. And just listen and look. Yes, I'm not asking you to close your eyes, but just be aware of where we are. Just experience where we are now. The people on either side of you.
if possible, with full attention. And some of you may have had some practice at this, but it's very interesting how the more you focus on where your bottom is, for example, or your feet, whether they're really on the ground or not, and you really listen and look, the more attentive you are, the more you see. And you realise that most of life we live inattentively and are never really aware of where we are, or very seldom. You look at people in the street, and you can see that people are not present. Isn't it so that the more you know, let us say we're 10% present and we increase it to 15% present. Almost as though in the other world opens up, isn't it? Can you even imagine what it is to be 50% present? And what about 100% present? those words of Jesus, every hair of your head is counted. Effortless, isn't it? And strangely enough, I wonder how many of you find your mind is completely quiet. And if it isn't, I suggest you just sharpen up your awareness of being present. In this moment now, this present or presence, you'll find a fulfillment. By what, with what, we cannot say. Why do we need to say it? It's just there, isn't it? Simplicity itself. <laughs> and what can I possibly say to improve? <laughs> <laughs> My work is done, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
Does this connect with that? It actually is here now, isn't it? Extraordinary, really, isn't it? Or maybe it's just natural. Just to be present. Explore it a bit further. What's happened to the past or the future? Or oh, indeed all the cares and riches and pleasures that pull us this way and that in ordinary life. At least they are out of the picture, really, aren't they? We can bring them back in again, but if we bring them back in again, you'll find you lose the present, don't we? This is our choice, to be or not to be. That's why Shakespeare said, to be present, or to be absent. And most of life is lived absent, isn't it? Absent from this presence. And so we have problems. there's one thing I've learned about being <coughs> put in this position. I assure you I'm not by nature a public figure at all, I'm the very opposite of that. I was rather unwillingly thrust into this role um, a few years ago. I'd never heard of internet and all these things then, and, uh, but rather against uh, my choice I got pushed into it and, uh, and now I find myself invited to sit in front of an audience here for heaven's sake. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what have I got to give you? Well, do you know, honestly, the thing I like being called best of all is, some of you may have heard it if you've watched the videos, is Mr. Nothing. Because honestly, the only thing I've got to well, I can't give it to you. The only thing I've got to share with you is this presence. And I've no idea how to spend the next hour. I haven't got an agenda or notes. I've no idea what to do. My mind's completely empty. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned to trust this. Because I don't know, but thank God, one way or another, I, 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 I've, uh, I've learned, I suppose, to that this presence is ever present. And I suppose through a long life, I've learned that almost everything else, that not almost everything else, fails. 
Oh, it comes to pass. It's transitory. Goodness me, I've lived long enough. I've had a long, interesting life with banks of experience. And where is it? It's all just flowed down the river. And gone, isn't it? All past loves and fears and one thing and another. All I've learned, as it were. And it's what's left, as it were. It's this, isn't it? So I can almost divide life between what is ephemeral, what is transitory, and what is not. What is eternal, because presence is ever-present, isn't it? Same presence as when I was a little boy. <coughs> And it's here, and it's where I live, and it was on the moors coming over. We can't not be in it, can we? Like fishes in the sea. And everything else in this world comes to pass. Once upon a time it came to pass that there was a little boy called John who went to school he grew up, he had adventures, he was a farmer, and now he's an old man, and there's his gravestone over there with the name John Butler. And it all takes place within this extraordinary present. It's the same for you, isn't it? And how many presences are there? <laughs> Isn't it just one present? We're all in it, aren't we? Like fishes in the sea. And it never fails. It's always present. And then, as if we're clever, we go on and add a few more bits to the puzzle. And uh, those of you that are uh, familiar with the Bible, what does Jesus say? I'm with you always. And what does God say on countless occasions? I am with you. Well, what's with us that doesn't fail? That never hurts us, never unkind, but always here. And the more we become acquainted with it, it becomes like a something that's sure, a comfort, an unfailing comfort, a strength, a rock in the shifting sea of what we call life. always here and all we have to do is feel our bottom on the chair just listen just look and there it is here in the street outside And what really, <coughs> you know, all the, the world is glorious, nobody questions that. But uh, what really compares to this? Isn't this the, the summum bonum of it all, really? What can we take with us beyond the grave? I'm sure you at my age, or one or two of you, in the same position. Becomes a very big issue indeed. What can we take with us? <laughs> A 
what can we be sure of? <clears throat> well, dears, that's it really. That's um that's it. But what we call life is mostly spent in dealing with what isn't it. The shadow, as it were. I found it so interesting, having been uh, taught the Bible quite well as a schoolboy. How many of those, particularly, well, throughout the Bible, the old stories begin to make sense, you know. What happened in paradise, you see? Adam walked with God. And then he followed his own way, didn't he? went to get into the, the commandment and uh, I forget if it's in the Bible where it is, but he fell out as it were, cast out of, of this uh, divine origin, found himself um, condemned to work condemned to work under the sentence of death. Why? Because in this is eternal life, is it not? It's uh, eternal, isn't it? It's alive, it's conscious, isn't it? It's not, uh, it's unchanging, yet it isn't static, is it? See it in your own experience. You don't have to read philosophy to understand it. It's alive, isn't it? In fact, once you start sort of paring away the skins of I am this, that and the other, you come back to what's there, what's here. This one that is in common with all of us. The I am. Not I am a boy or a girl or this age or that age. But this that I am. And I don't need to tell you that when Moses asked God his name, I am. And Jesus, I am. never very interested in what's called self-realization or this trying to figure out what I am is. I know it, it, a lot of people love that, that pursuit of, of what I am. <coughs> I think as a young man, I think still now, the overriding aim of my life was to, was love. to love and be loved in totality. And I never, f I always found it, the trouble with human love is that it, it comes, it, it starts, but it usually doesn't continue. There's a sort of, it, it's very difficult, so I've never really found it. That totality, that total self-abandonment to love, Total. Except in this. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I tell you, I haven't got a prepared talk, but I'll, I'll waffle about a bit. But um, 
<laughs> Perhaps I better just stop that line of thought and come back to meditation, which, um, which I think quite a number of you probably practice. I learnt to meditate when I was 26. God, that's nearly 60 years ago, and I was very well taught at school in London. And one of the few sort of good things I've done in my life is practice meditation twice a day ever since. It's extraordinary. God knows how many hours that, that adds up to. And I still do. And one of the things about meditation is, I remember it being demonstrated to me that it's like this. You let go. And like when you let go the weights of a balloon, what happens? You see? Just like you're all doing when you're present, you see? It happens naturally, doesn't it? We go up and we access a... What do you call it? What happens when the balloon goes up into the sky? It goes through the clouds, doesn't it? And what's beyond the clouds? so simple, isn't it? <laughs> and not all this uh, worries, the preoccupations of the mind, you see, are just clouds, really. You don't need to worry about them. You don't waste time trying to sort out the mind. It's useless. <laughs> but if you just find an effective way of meditation, you just go through them. And there you find that. Being present is like we're at the sort of first step, we sort of just at the threshold out of it. This is the indication, the, uh, this is the way, you see. But if it whets your appetite, if you just sort of, if it just makes you feel more and more deeper and deeper, well, where's the limit? Where does it end? Hmm? Where does the sky end? It's infinite, isn't it? Where does infinity end? This is the adventure of adventure, the adventures that never ends. See, some of you have that glint in your eyes. We don't need to name it or wrap it around with clever ideas, do we? It's just there. It's extraordinary how we fall from this into... Good, so I've completely forgotten. I've got an old man's body sitting here. I can hardly creep along without a stick. <laughs> How old am I? How old are you? Hmm? Or are we ageless? Hmm? Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. What a marvellous thing. Here's a room full of people all nodding your heads when I say, aren't we ageless? How about care-less? <laughs> <No. laughs> it begins to make sense, doesn't it? And it's these all presents, you see. It's just given to us, a gift, isn't it? Come unto me, says Jesus. Come, come, come. It's so simple. Now, as I told you, I don't know what to say. I suppose I could just sort of waddle off in any direction, but if any of you'd like to. <coughs> Give me a theme to 
you got a question or something, you've, it would be very helpful. Let's come back to being present. To understand all these questions, we need to be present. And then, as Jesus tells us, because being present, we, we find this invisible, silent consciousness. Which, incidentally, silence, we've talked about it being unchanging, haven't we? It's, it's stillness, isn't it? It's ever abiding with us. O oh, thou that changeth not, abide with me. We don't have to ask for it, it's already abiding here. It is with us. Are we with it? That's the question. And how much of us is with it? 1%? 2%? 3%? That's the question. Now, I assure you, dear, there's not one of you here in this room that's fully present. If you did, you'd explode. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly wouldn't be sitting in a corrupt body. Because this is spirit, isn't it? And what's this? This is flesh. And the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh is just dust. I know when we're young and beautiful, we, it seems to have a value. I dare say it does. Serves a purpose for a few years, doesn't it? Then it goes back to dust again. So none of us are present. This is the human condition, which in scripture is called sin, which is absence from the presence of God. That's what sin is. Hmm? So, the one thing we can say about ourselves for sure is that we're all sinners. And from this state of absence, we may do our best to make some sort of connection with what is present. And every step we take is very good. But this is what we have to deal with in this world. This is really what's called the work, the real work which is, in biblical language, is repentance, which is coming back to God. Sorry, I wandered off. I'm sorry, I tend to do this. But let me come back to this being present, you see, which is, which is stillness, which is also infinite space, isn't it? Hmm? That which fills this room and fills the street outside, which contains the whole world. It's freedom. Unlimited. It's also peace, isn't it? The peace that passeth understanding. Isn't it love? in love that never says no total love unconditional love spirit and what this nebula is something we call God where do any of these things begin or end or do they just all merge into each other in this one presence with us and all in our different ways we usually search for some aspect or other of this that ultimately all comes together in this universal union one oneness in which we're all partakers we are like strayed children, lost sheep, you see, that have wandered away from home. So we're all a bit confused, looking around, which way to go and what to do. 
And then we get hints and indications and little glimpses of what it is that we're really yearning for in our hearts, all of us. And they begin the pilgrim's progress of step by step coming home. So my dear, what you seek is already here, but we are not. And it's very good, the more you recognize how absent you are and what it is that pulls you away and gradually you can try to be more present. And there are many, many countless ways of, uh, of doing this and you find one that suits you and God bless you. Stick at it. Because <clears throat> there's nothing that's more worthwhile both for yourself and as a service to the world. Because if you yourself find this, then you cease to obstruct it. This is what we do. Here is, here is the presence. But if we were all talking, we simply block it off, don't we? We cut it off. The first of sinners is always me. The problem with the world is me. It's not you or the government or anybody else. The only one to blame is me. It all starts here. So get that one into your head, dear, and you're well on the way. Most people don't like it. It wasn't long ago that somebody Somebody, oh, I know what it was, because when people, <laughs> I told you, I was, I was <coughs> I, I'd never been anything in this life, and, uh, and it was only when I suddenly became known and people started coming to see me, I did, I really, well, I still don't really know what they come for. <laughs> you know, what, what have I got to give them? And then I remember asking somebody, well, what do you come for? She thought, didn't I? and said, nothing really. <laughs> and I, I didn't realise that that's exactly, isn't it? Because it's, it's this, see, come back here, come back to this presence. See, the answer is all, always by coming back to this, you see. Don't ask anybody about it. Always come back here. And uh, again, as Jesus says, the Spirit teaches you all things. This is a teacher, and the only teacher you need, I assure you. There's none better. Put not your trust in any child of man. This presence is no thing, is it? It's not a thing. You can't describe it. Whatever you can describe is not it. Because if you dis can describe it or give it a name, you just put it in a little box, which is not something else. Mm -hmm. Now the real things in this life, no one can describe. You can't describe silence, can you? Or stillness. Or freedom, or love. After all we talk about it, who knows what God is? Nobody knows what God is, in the sense that you can describe it. And yet, it's, it's easy, it's simple, isn't it? Any child can be present. You've got no difficulties, none of you, I can see you. And yet you don't know what it is. Well, not in the sense that you can describe it, it's beyond description, isn't it? See, description is the clouds. We can describe clouds, look, they're all of different shapes, but then they have become whispier and whispier as we go up through the clouds. You're not really quite sure whether it's a cloud or not. And then you go up into the clear sky, 
And how do you describe that? Well, take it even further and and that's that's when reality begins. You go beyond limits. In this world we live in a world of limits. We're imprisoned, you see, aren't we? Imprisoned in this little thing called me, me and my thoughts. This is what we live in, this little world which is different to yours, isn't it? And I'm right and you're wrong. It all takes place in this. You come up into the big country, and what's right or wrong? Who knows? There's no what's called duality. You come into the world of unity. It's all right here and now. Utter simplicity. Well, because we are so conditioned to be absent that it seems unnatural to be present, you see. You see, it may be easy, quite easy for you now because you come out here, you made a special effort, you followed what I'm, I'm doing, but you go out into the street again, I bet your boots you'll all be absent in a jiffy. <laughs> We're brought up this way. We're brought up to be different. You know, we, we talk. It's a, you know, this the whole world is absent. You know, most many people are quite uncomfortable with being silent. Mm. Actually, my sister. I remember her once telling me because she likes to keep a noise going on either the radio or the music or something. And uh, I remember her telling me, oh, um, "Well, I just like noise." Oh, people do. A lot of people like noise and they sort of feel uncomfortable in silence because silence seems empty, doesn't it? It's nothing. Exactly, it's nothing. And uh, I've had a lot of experience of meditation. A lot of people are quite frightened, really, of, of, uh, of losing this and venturing up into that. It's... it's we don't know what we don't know. It is frightening. You lose your structure. It is unknown, and yet you were all comfortable enough a few minutes ago, weren't you, sitting in this? Yes. Were any of you frightened? But when you go up on the hills, I'm sure you all do from time to time, and look out at those views, is it frightening? Yes, some people are more comfortable in the city, I know. But most people are, love it, don't they? They feel expanded. Yes, most people just want a little bit of that and they come back home and switch the telly, telly on again. Well, we have to... It's a progress. It takes time. It takes time to become, first of all, acquainted with this, then familiar with this, and then realise how gradually this, as this becomes perhaps ever more natural, this becomes ever more unnatural, the lower world, the noise, the inattentiveness. Yes, perhaps that's a good way to put it. You just... The world loses its attraction. And you realise how talking... When people talk, of invariably you're absent. And what do people talk about? They talk about me, don't they? People always talk about themselves. <laughs> almost entirely. Just listen to talk, I, 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 all the time, isn't it? And we're brought up this way. So it takes a lot of unravelling, as it were. See, when we're young, well, I know I did, I wanted to make the world a better place, and I'm sure most of you do. 
what can I do to make the world a better place? Well, we start off by maybe picking up plastic or something. <laughs> you know. But then you gradually delve into it more and more and more. What's the cause, the cause of it all? Why is the world such a... Why is it all wrong, the life around us? It's a search. Search and search and search. And eventually we begin to realise, particularly if we have some sort of practice, meditation practice that gives us some acquaintance of this presence, in which there's nothing wrong, is there? For those moments that we're present, there's nothing wrong. At that, in that state of presence, there is no problem and there's nothing wrong and there's nothing lacking. And yet down here, the world's full of problems, needs, aches and pains. You have this, these two contrasts. And gradually this sort of inner compass within us just finds this more attractive. It makes, it makes sense. This is the answer. And this is our absence. And sin suddenly becomes meaningful. It may be politically unacceptable now to talk about sin, but it's all there in the good book, isn't it? And I, I re recommend it to you. It's a very helpful way of understanding life and why it is that life is as it is, why we die. Because we're simply cut off from the, absent from the source of life, source of eternal life. It's here before our eyes. It, we are absent. And, uh, oh yes, that, sorry, I'm sorry, my mind isn't very consistent, but you see, one of the consequences of leaving paradise is, as God says, cursed is the world for thy sake. Because once we lose this presence, when you are present, you see that everything is present. In fact, I might say it's perfect. God looked at the world and saw that it was God. And yet we lose that, we come to a, a lower level of consciousness where we're separate, so we look out and see separation. The world is what we make it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and so is corruption. These are the eyes of mortality. These don't see anything, really. These are the eyes of death. Look, they're in the body of death. <laughs> so we look out and we see death, world of death. We hear with these physical things that hear physical sounds. But real sight is insight. When you see with our spiritual eyes, then you begin to see things. And then you realize that this world is just a, a fallout, as it were, a precipitation, a, a crystallization of the real world. Yes, I rather wish I wasn't put in this position of talking like this. I'd really be more comfortable with being quiet. Because uh, if I tell you what, as, uh, if I speak from my experience like this, it may well contrast with what you experience yourself. Um, well, you're not a child, my dear, you lived long life like I have. But that doesn't mean to say we have the same experience or see things as we see it. Look, <clears throat> if we'd both been to Australia, we might describe it differently, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I'd probably be more interested in the, in the sheep and the kangaroos, <laughs> and you might be more interested in the, in the 
I don't know, they had some surf riders. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you, you stick to your guns, dear, and believe what, and, 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 uh, and be, and trust to what you have been given to experience. And I'll do the same and we'll love and respect each other. <laughs> and there's no need, there's no need for any contention. I love the saying that with God, all things are possible. And it's certainly true, isn't it? Mm. Yes, I hope that, of course, my words won't be real, perhaps not, but perhaps they may serve a purpose in just encouraging you. Yes, that's, that's the word. If it encourages you, dear, to, to pursue this path, to, uh, to, uh, that it's worth doing. And that this hope in a hopeless world. Yes. Well, I was taught to do this. But of course you don't. You, 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 things, particularly things you love, you hang on to for grim death, don't you? Where does beauty be end? And you see there's... Um, think of the, the, the phrase, going from glory to glory. To glory. Hmm. Where does beauty end? Yes, of course, we start with this world, the beauty of what's all around us, what is not beautiful when you look at it with the eyes. Of, to the pure, all things are pure, aren't they? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And the purer the eye is, the more beautiful things are. Where does it end? From glory to glory. Where does love end? When I wrote my first book, um, the publisher didn't like the title. I called it Adventure Without End, but he didn't like that. And, and for ages we were wondering what to call it. And then one day I thought of this word, unfoldment which I don't think existed at that time, although some people tell me it did exist. Anyway, it wasn't in the dictionary. Anyway, it's, it, it's, not, it's actually quite a good word, isn't it? Because it is, it's this perpetual unfolding, unfoldment. That, I assure you, my dears, you can see how old I am, and I'm just starting this adventure. I'm, re <laughs> I'm really just a little boy in a grey beard. And, and if I've learned anything, it's like I'm sort of in elementary school, and about ready to move on into secondary school. I won't even say high school yet. You know, it just gets bigger and bigger, and better and better, doesn't it? You know. What can I do? Look, look at me, I can hardly... Well, look, when I say young, I was a farmer, a strong young man. I could do anything, so I thought. I had strong muscles, lift heavy weights, do anything. Well, gradually that dies out and you begin to get uh, more, use your head probably more. You begin to learn, try to figure out things, the big questions with your mind. And then, uh, it's funny, looking back now, I can see that, that really spiritual development is really just like growing, just like we grow out of childhood without quite knowing how, growing to our school days, and then somehow again, suddenly we find ourselves young men and women. We move into our prime, we can do things then, can't we? We think we can. And then we grow, people think we grow out of that and we become old. And then we grow out of being old, you know. 
we grow out of this mortality into, if we've been practicing long enough, <laughs> into immortality, into spirit. And it's just a series of growing up, literally. We grow up and out of lower states of consciousness into higher states of consciousness. And then we begin to function more from here. You know, you none of you function as little children because you're all grown up. But you're now at various stages of growing up, some older than others. And then we grow out of this, grow out of the body altogether. It's not the end, it's the beginning. And then you realise that mortality, well, what is it? What's the sort of school to teach us what we're not? A school of elimination, really, of purging us of our mistakes, where we learn by our mistakes that we're not at home, we're not in heaven, we're not present, we're absent. And that's why we get troubles in this world and die. Well, we, if you draw this way, you'll study these questions and probably come to the same conclusion as I have. Of course, most people aren't interested particularly. And so they die, <coughs> try not to, but we all do. <coughs> so it's recommended that we uh, <laughs> come to church on Sundays or something. <laughs> we'll start thinking about it. So what do we we suffer? Why do we suffer? All these are very all these are lessons, you see. Why are things as they are? Well, it seems to me that life's just a great schooling, really. Some of us learn more than others, maybe. In order to be what we are, I remember being told we have to come out of what we are not. And uh, as we observe the performance, performance, the form, the name and form of things, you can see the performance is just a performance, isn't it? An enactment. And the actor is not the act. And you see, you'll see the performance and the, the seer is not the thing that is seen, is it? There, there are levels of consciousness, countless levels of consciousness. I find this a very helpful way of, of, uh, of understanding life. <clears throat> um, to start off, obviously enough, the body. Hmm? Well, you can even think of the rocks, if you like. Take it uh, the rocks, the living earth, the plants, the animals, different grades of animals and birds. Um, think of a worm's eye view of life, or an eagle's eye view of life. See, exactly the same world, the same with different points of view, and that makes all the difference, doesn't it? And how man too can operate from a very low level of, of just instinctive touch and feel to subtle and subtle through the mind, layers of the mind, emotions, up to what is beyond the mind, as it were. And it, up, it goes up into the higher, higher levels of spiritual awareness. And uh, I like to think of the mind really as, uh, I think how our tummies is, is digesting, all of our tummies are digesting and you've hardly noticed them for the last hour, have you? And yet they're all just digesting these things you put into them. Well, the mind is really, uh, I suggest to you, like a, a mental digestive system, just digesting all the various impressions and thoughts and talk that's gone into it. And, throughout your life, and it's all there just sort of working it out in your mind. It's perfectly all right, nothing to change about it, 
that walk perfectly normal, just like your tummy, here it is in your mind. And but the trouble is, it's, it's, it's limited, isn't it? One can go so far with the mind, you can spend your lifetime exploring the mind. A lot of people do, and never go beyond it. But if you um, are greedy, if like I was, and you want more, whatever it is, love, most people want love, don't they? And yet you can't really, well, we, a lot of us do try to sort of think our way to love, don't we? and think of it as a mental process, but actually it, it gets bigger, it's more than that, isn't it? And will lead you beyond thinking into the higher consciousness. And once you get a taste for that, then you want more of it, more and more. This is really what may encourage those of you who meditate to keep going on and on. And the, higher, and the higher you go, in a way, the, the mind sort of becomes less and less. And, uh, and these these thoughts that seem so sort of totally dominating when you're in them, you can just smile at them. You can think anything you like, and the world can be, is like you can see it as a projection of what we think. Mind is creative, isn't it? Thought is creative. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And then what happens when you go to sleep at night? Where's the world then? Hmm? Was it real or was it unreal? And what happens when you have a dream and you wake up in the morning? What happens to it? Was it real or unreal? I'm not too keen on these words like reality or use words and often get a mixed blessing. <laughs> That's why I come back to this present, you see, it's so simple. Present. And all that we're talking about is just settles down, doesn't it? Was it real? It was real in its time and place. Perhaps it's just superseded by, by this. Perhaps we just grow out of it. <laughs>